Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, howdy. howdy! It's good to see you guys. Merry Christmas. Uh, if you have a Bible, we are in Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read to you a couple verses, uh, starting in verse 10, and uh, it may not initially strike you as a Christmas text, but uh, I think maybe why we're talking about this will become apparent as we do it. So Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for a few minutes around your word together. Thanks, God, for everybody you've brought here. Um, Wherever we're landing, God, in the spectrum of understanding things about you, loving you, knowing you, I just am grateful you've gathered us to talk about how the world works, how we're meant to engage it in a way that honors you and helps us. And so I just want to ask for your grace, God, as we talk about what what it is to be at peace, I pray you would show us, Lord, the path. Show us the path to peace. Show us how to live into that in this season. And uh, we're asking you to do it, God. Meet with us, please, in these few moments together. And I just want to pray or ask you, if you're willing to, you ask him, pray and say, God, please teach me something right now. Uh, And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's been a strange month in the Stewart house. Uh, about a month ago, uh, I woke up with my neck kind of stiff, which is not uh, super big news. But uh, then over the course of a few days, my right arm kept going numb and uh, then uh, lost some strength, wasn't able to do a lot of things with it I can normally do. So I uh, was in a neurosurgeon's office last week and it didn't take years of medical school to figure out when he showed me the MRI Uh, Yeah, one of these discs in your neck does not look like the others. When it's sticking way out and pressing the spinal cord, that looks like a problem. And uh, sure enough, I've got uh, my fourth bulging disc so far. And uh, this one is uh, uh, cutting off some nerves to my right arm. So uh, it's kind of been an interesting ride. They're hopeful that it will resolve itself. But in the meantime, you just kind of got to live into the pain. So for a few weeks there, uh, I was not sleeping particularly well when the drugs they give you, for me, give me about two, three hours of sleep a night. Uh, so there was one particular night a few weeks ago where uh, I was awake, two o'clock, and uh, hurt to lay down to sleep, hurt to read because I hurt to bend my neck. So I was just sort of sitting on my couch looking forward <laughs> and going, okay. And so I decided to go, all right, God, we're here. Uh, what do you want to talk about? Because you're really limiting my options of what I can do. <laughs> and uh, I thought maybe I'll just live into, you know, the sermons that I had scheduled to preach. And so I looked at this text, knowing we were going to cover it, and just read the line. Uh, I have learned in whatever situation to be content. And I thought, okay, I guess you want me to live into that a little bit more than I was hoping to. But why don't you show me how to do that, God? I don't want to just preach it to y'all like, here's some advice for you people. Merry Christmas. But now I got to live into this. How do I do that? In whatever situation I'm in, I'm content. How do you live there? How do you be okay when everything's not okay? 
That's the question. And I know not everybody in this room has had spinal issues. I pray you don't. But I think all of us have been in situations where we said, okay, my circumstances, don't like them. Don't like this job and how it's going. Or don't like that I don't have a job. Or don't like these people around me. Or don't like the fact that I'm alone. Or don't like the amount of money I have or don't have. Or I don't like this situation. I don't like the way the holidays are shaping up. I don't like the circumstances I'm in. All of us have been in that place where you go, man, I'm in some circumstances, experiencing the things. I don't like this. So how do I deal with it? How do I live into that? Because here's the reality. We all know life's hard. And we got to figure out how do we navigate that well. And here's the thing. I don't know that it, here in America, we're real good at handling it. It's interesting. I work with college students. And uh, so I've read multiple articles about them. And in multiple news outlets, they've put out a recent study that the American Psychological Association put out uh, called Stress in America. And they determined the most stressed out generation in the country today are people in their 20s. So my people that I minister to, college students, have the dubious honor of being the most stressed out people in America. Uh, and so we were looking at that, all these different articles. Why are they so stressed? And they said, maybe it's because uh, they don't have a job, uncertain job market, financial instability. But then they said, but the interesting thing is when you study them, when they get a job and get money, they're still stressed. So these articles were trying to guess. Maybe it's a lack of a job, except when they get a job, they're still stressed. So that doesn't work. So basically the article doesn't know. But 20 year olds are stressed. And you can look at that as someone who's not 20 and go, ah, kids, you know? Well, what's interesting is you keep reading the article, and many of them, and The Economist is the one that goes so deeply into it, they say what happens is stress does diminish towards the end of your 20s. But what happens is what they call the U-bend. That is, they've been studying self-reported happiness in people all around the country and the world. What they find is beginning in your 20s and going through 40s or so, uh, there's just this slow decline in happiness. And by slow, I mean... I'm sorry, precipitous cliff of happiness. <laughs> but you linger down there, and then it kind of slowly turns the corner, and apparently by your 60s or 70s, you're just happy as can be. But uh, <laughs> they call it the U-bend, and they were trying to figure that out. Why does it work that way? And they're like, okay, why does stress end in your 20s? It's because you, it's replaced by sadness. And uh, they're like, all right. Why does that happen? They're like, maybe it's because you have kids, and kids are stressful, or maybe because those are your work years, and work stinks. And so they started testing for all that. Let's, let's pull out people who have jobs, people who don't, people who have kids, don't have kids, married, not married, USA, other countries, let's try it. And they took all these external factors out and they realized no matter what country you're in, no matter what external ha factors are happening, people over the several generations, decades of your life are unhappy. It doesn't matter circumstance, it doesn't matter where you are. Just an unhappiness settles in for about four decades. <laughs> and so if you just had the data that's your answer to college kids. I'm so stressed out. We're like, look, kids, don't worry. The stress subsides. It just sort of dissipates under the crushing weight of sadness that's going to come uh, for the next few decades. Then you'll be fine when you're like 70. That's what the data shows. We're not a happy people. And if we change our circumstances, because that's what most of us pray for, Right? God just changed my circumstances, then I'll be happy. Change the circumstances, then I'll be happy. But what happens is we, we're not, demonstrably. What we need is the ability to flourish regardless of circumstance. That's what we need. Because a lot of the factors you can add in or take out aren't fixing it. And so into this mix of realizing life's hard and we're having trouble handling it, you walk into a text like Philippians, which is so fascinating because the guy who wrote it is in prison. He's in jail while he's writing, and he's not real sure if they're going to kill him or not at the end of it. That's the beginning of the letter. He's like, so I might get out or I might die. Just that's the update. But I'm in prison. And yet you read the whole letter, and he's upbeat. The word joy shows up more than any other book. And here at the end, he's like, hey, guys, I just want you all to know I'm good. And you see a guy in jail, and he's blowing the U-curve. He's happy, he's content, he's satisfied. And if you're serious about, I wanna be satisfied and changing circumstances isn't gonna take it, how do I get there? Because contentment's hard to find in our culture today. Look around. When we're in one season, we wanna be in the other. When it's hot, we wish it was cold. When it's cold, we wish it was hot, right? When Christmas comes, I just can't wait till Christmas. And the family comes, I can't wait till it's over, right? Or like, man, I can't wait to have people around. How do I get these people out of here? I can't wait to, we're never happy. And yet here Paul is, 
and he's happy. And how do you get there? How do you get there? Well, he's writing to the Philippians, and what he tells them is the letter you find out is a thank you note. They supported his ministry financially. And so he's thanking them for supporting him. But he was also the mentor that taught them about Jesus. So he wants to give them perspective about money. So he thanks them for the money. But then as soon as he does that, did you catch the text? He says, thank you for reviving your concern for me. And he says, but to tell you the truth, I was okay. I'm not saying thank you because that's sort of some weird way to get more money. And he said, and I also want you to know, it wasn't that I was in prison and sad and then I got money and now I'm happy. He said, that's not the message I want to teach my people. He said, I loved that you thought of me, but let me tell you something about me. He says, I'm content no matter what situation. In any situation, I've learned to be content. And he's not saying I've learned that I'm supposed to be content. He's saying I've learned to be content. Whether I have a lot of money or no money, whether I have an abundance or need, I know how to be content. And what's interesting is Paul isn't just saying that hypothetically. I think I'd be okay if I was poor. Paul's felt it. He grew up with money. He came from privilege. And he also knew what it was to be beaten and imprisoned and homeless. He has lived at either end of the spectrum. And he says, in all of that, I have learned how to be a content person, right? No matter where I am. And what's fascinating is that word contentment, it means to be self-sufficient. I've learned to have a sufficiency that's not dependent on circumstances. That was the pinnacle of success for the Stoics. It's, it's the goal of the Buddhist. So many world religions, so many people want to find that place of serenity. Paul's sitting in prison and he says, serenity? Oh yeah, I got that. I have that. I figured that one out. That's what he's saying. He says, I've got contentment. And incidentally, let me just throw this out there. You want this, right? I tell young people that this is what you're going to want in someone you marry till 20 something. No guy wants to marry Barbie that won't be content unless I got the multi-million house and the multi-million car and the whatever. Say, I'll just be super happy. Just give me everything I want. Every thought that pops in my head, buy it. You know, like Guys want to date a girl that would love that stuff, but would still be okay if we didn't have it, right? For better or for worse. That's why we say that in the ceremony, right? And, and girls want that in guys. You don't want a guy that's a cry-cry whenever the slightest thing doesn't go their way. No girl wants a guy like that, right? The coffee's cold, my day's ruined. You're like, I don't want to be around you. We want to be around these kind of people because we're impressed by these kind of people. And here's the thing. Paul says, I learned it twice. This kind of peace and serenity that surpasses situations, it's not just, well, that's just his temperament. He's just an easygoing guy. I think he's from California. No. He says, I learned it, which means it's learnable. It's acquirable. But it's a secret. That's what he calls it. It's not something that's just sitting out there. You've got to press in to learn it. He literally says, I've been initiated. There's a little club called people who are happy. And he said, and I'm in it. And I'm going to teach you how to get there. That's what he tells them. So we got to figure out three things. What is true contentment? Really, what are we talking about? Where does it come from? And how do we get it? That's what we're going to do in the remainder of our time. Now, to look at what is true contentment, there was a guy, Jeremiah Burroughs, a pastor in the 1600s, wrote a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It's a beautiful little book. And he has a definition of contentment he got from this text that I think is spot on. He says, Christian contentment is an inward, peaceful disposition. That's what it is. An inward, peaceful disposition. That's what we're looking for. Inward. That means it's not rooted in circumstances. It's in my heart. No matter what's happening out here, the mountains may crumble into the sea, but I won't cry. He says, I've got stability that's inward. It transcends my circumstances. Now, to say that means this also. It's an inward peace. What he means by that is it's not just I pretend like I'm at peace. That's not the goal. I love the way he writes this, 1600s, and he writes about how different people deal with stress. Just hear if this sounds like you or anyone you know. He says, some people are so weak that they cannot restrain the unrest of their spirits, but in words and behavior, they reveal what woeful disturbances are within. Their spirits are like the raging sea, casting forth nothing but mire and dirt and are troublesome not only to themselves, but also to all with whom they live. And some of you hear that and you go, how does he know my family? 
And he says, there are people that way, whenever something doesn't make them happy, the world's gonna know. It's like waves churning up mire and dirt. Thank you for making us all sad. Thank you. But then on the other side, he says, others are able to restrain such disorders of heart. You can keep your mouth shut. But even so, they boil inwardly and eat away like a canker, which I don't even know what that is, but it sounds horrible. <laughs> These people, while there is serene calm upon their tongues, have blistering storms upon their spirits. And while they keep silence and their hearts are troubled, even worn away with anguish and vexation, they have peace and quiet outwardly, but within war from an unruly and turbulent workings of their heart. He says, that's not contentment. He says, I don't want you to just be so nagging and complaining about everything, but the goal is not to be quiet with your mouth, but inside your heart's raging. He says, that's not the goal of the Bible, that you would be furious and sad and mad at God and angry and depressed and say, how are you doing? I'm fine, blessed, <laughs> praise the Lord. That's not the win today. The win is not just to get you to change what you say. It's inward. It's a change in the heart. It's inward. It's an inward peace, an inward quiet. That's what he calls it. Now, for the sake of clarity, let me say what this is not opposed to. When I say it's a peaceful inward disposition, that doesn't mean you're ignorant of your afflictions. Some people think that's what the Bible's advocating. I just pretend like problems aren't problems. Man, I'm so sad your neck's hurt. No, it's no big deal. I'm so sad your mom's sick. Oh, it doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. You know, like, no. <laughs> The, the, the Bible doesn't say to call crosses not crosses. It says you can acknowledge something's hard. You can say there's a thing in my life I don't like. That peace does not require ignorance. It doesn't. That the Bible has a category of human being that can be fully briefed on a situation, understand the difficulty of it, and yet still be at peace. That's possible. That's part of what we're advocating here. So it doesn't mean you're ignorant of afflictions and it doesn't mean that you can't voice those struggles to God or a friend. Contentment doesn't mean you don't tell your problems to God. A content person can say to God, God, I'm dealing with this thing. I don't like it. I want it to go away. Contentment is not going, I broke my leg. Thanks, broken legs are the best. Like, no. <laughs> Contentment can say, God, I'm at peace here, but I would like these circumstances to change. Contentment doesn't mean you can't ask for help. Content people can ask for assistance and thank people when it's given to you. Contentment's not against any of those things. So what is contentment against? It's against complaining. It's against freaking out with worry and panic. It's against sinking into discouragement, right? It's against sinful shiftings into some unhealthy behavior to get relief, blasting out in anger, turning to some broken and unhelpful things for relief. It's against casting off Christian duty. Some people, when they run into situations that are hard, they say, God's made this situation hard, and so God, if you're not helping me, I'm not helping you, and it's a situation where now I can justifiably be rude to this person, rude to that person, mean to this person, blow off that, because y'all don't know my pain. That's not contentment. A content person can be in the middle of difficulty asking God to relieve it, and yet they can still move forward, right? Uh, there's a story I didn't have time to tell the first service. I'll tell you guys, a little, little something for you. Uh, I remember I had a buddy, um, had surgery at a hospital and uh, because he had like a, his appendix needed taken out. Burst, scary, take it out. Got it taken out. Turned out there was some infection from the surgery. So he ended up what was supposed to be a simple operation, took like a week and uh, the bills stacked up. And uh, he didn't have a good insurance plan. I don't even know if he had any. I mean, it was bad, uh, the amount of money he owed. It was the kind of thing you're like, you're going to pass along to your children, like your father gives you crushing debt. You know, like it was going to be hard. But he was driving away from the hospital, trying to land on this new reality he was dealing with after going through all this. And there was a woman on the side of the road with a flat tire. And yeah, my life's hard, but there's a lady out there with a flat tire. What do you do? You go help her. So he goes and helps lay the flat tire, puts the deals on. She's like, hey, what's going on? Well, I'm leaving the hospital. Oh, what'd you have done? Penicillin, infection, turned into this, big bills, da, da, da. She's like, oh my gosh, okay, yeah. Well, I work in the financial offices over there. Uh, give me your information. And she went there and she canceled his bill. So content people 
don't neglect Christian duty. Sometimes it works out for you. It's a inward, peaceful disposition, frame of mind. That means it's not just trying to tell yourself to calm down. Just calm down, Ben, calm down. Keep it together. Hold it together, buddy. That's not contentment. <laughs> contentment is that it stays. It lingers, right? It's a peaceful frame of spirit. It's my MO. It's how I deal with the world. That's what the Bible's advocating. Wouldn't that be a wonderful person to be? Inside of me, no matter what happens, there's a serenity, there's a peace, there's a calm. That doesn't mean I have to say I like every situation, but in the midst of them, I can still operate. I can still be a blessing to the world. I can still be good. How do you get there? Where on earth does that come from? If circumstances don't generate that, if money won't, if, if all these different changing external factors won't, where does it come from? Paul says in verse 11, I'm content. Verse 12, he tells you, I learned the secret how. Verse 13, he tells you where it comes from. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Where does this inner peace come from? Entirely through the agency of another. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, some people read that, and you've heard it quoted. You see it on the back of T-shirts, and people are running marathons and stuff. And that's not bad. This isn't a verse for marathons, necessarily. What Paul is saying in context is not, I can accomplish anything through God's strength. What he's saying is that I can be at peace. I can be content. I can be a functional human being in whatever circumstance. That's what he's saying. Why? Because my strength, literally, if you want to be wooden about the translation, because I'm strong in all because of the strengthening one. That's why. I have strength because of the strengthening one who's with me. The Christian sufficiency isn't a self-sufficiency. That's what the Stoics thought. What you do is I just try to act self-sufficient, but you're not. And you'll see people do that. Just try to go, man, even when life's hard, I'm not going to tell people it's hard. No, I'm fine. No, I don't need help. And there's men, we love to do this. When I'm injured, no, it doesn't hurt, right? And what happens? You make things worse. Or some people have some different internal emotional crises. And they say, no, it's fine. Let me just eat these emotions, stuff them down deep inside, right? And what happens? They make you sick. Will physically make you sick. You can't handle certain things. You can handle it in the sense that you don't go postal, but it'll break you. It'll break you. And yet here Paul is in one of the most difficult circumstances you can imagine. This is in first world prison. But he's okay. Why? Because my sufficiency isn't a self-sufficiency. It's radical dependency. I can thrive. Why? Because I have a strength that comes from the strengthening one. Because he's with me. I can do all things through him. So if you want the full definition, Christian contentment is a peaceful inward disposition that freely submits to and delights in union with the Almighty. That's how I get it. I am peaceful in the arms of the Almighty, the one who cares for me. You see it with children. When we're raising kids in our society, what happens? Kids without parents, what happens to them? They develop a lot of problems later. Statistically, a number of them do. Anxiety, in terms of anger, lack of some functioning, right? So what happens when you got a kid that's free-floating in society? They look for a stable home environment. That's what they call it, right? These little kids need to grow up in a stable home environment. What does that mean? What are we saying when we say that? I want to reduce this kid's stress later in life. I don't want to make them insecure and hurt and wounded in life. So what do I need to give them? Stability. What does that mean? It doesn't mean rich, a kid can grow up in a great home that doesn't have a lot of money. So what does that kid need? If a kid's gonna grow up and flourish as a human being, what does he need? I'll tell you what he needs. What he needs is to know the one who has power over me cares. That's what they need. If a little kid can be in a situation where they know the people who have power over me care about me, that kid can flourish. You can put that kid in a, million dollar house without that and you'll have an anxious kid. You can put that kid in a one bedroom apartment but if the one who has power over them cares about him, you create a stable human being. And it's the same with you and I. Where does Paul's stability come from? 
because the one who rules over my circumstances cares about me. He cares about me. And when I have that, I'm stable. I can sing, right? That's what Paul has. That's what we need. And when you see this worked out in society, it's powerful. I remember for me when I was on staff here full time at Faith Bridge, as a young guy, I was single. And uh, I, I remember the first date I ever went on uh, with now my wife, Donna. Um, I didn't tell a lot of people here at Faith Bridge um, because the church was small back then. And I was like the single guy at Faith Bridge. And so when you're surrounded by all married people that are kind of bored and you're single, it's always like, so what's going on? I got a cousin. You know, they're kind of interested. And uh, if I brought a girl around, it was going to be, I just didn't want the administrative work of having to explain to everybody. <laughs> we're just kind of seeing how this goes. So I was trying to kind of keep it a secret. And so uh, I picked her up and we're going on our first date driving into Houston. And I remember as we're driving in, I get a phone call uh, and they say, hey, Ben, this family, the, the family I was closest to, young family at Faith Bridge. They said their little baby that was just born, uh, he's got an erratic heartbeat. It's just fluttering out of control. They can't get it to stop. They had to race him to the hospital. Not sure if he's gonna make it. And so I'm driving into Houston to take her to this deal and I hang up the phone. I say, hey, plans change. We're driving to the hospital because this might be it. So we pull up at the hospital and it was a weird moment because we walk into the waiting room and there's all these Faith Bridge people there ready to pray for them and it's, Weird because they're concerned for this family and they're also confused that I'm there with a girl. So they're like, I'm glad you're, wait, what? what? But we can't talk about this right now. There's something else like a oh, big talk coming later. Okay. <laughs> but the moment came where, where the, the wife, uh, the, the mom, uh, they told me you can go in and see her. And so I go in there and, and the little baby's, you know, in this little, I don't know, incubator thing with all these tubes hooked up and it's, uh, it's scary looking scary looking and a lot of question marks and she's got a little finger through this hole where his hand can can grab it and I don't know what I'm about to say 20 something year old guy I don't have words for her I don't know what she's going to be thinking what are you thinking at that moment I have no idea but I walk up and I'll never forget walking up to that moment and she said uh, she said Ben he's not mine she said the Lord brought him in this world. He's the Lord's. And the Lord gave him to me, and I want him here, and I want him here for a long time. But this is a reminder that he belongs to God, and I trust him. I trust him. And I didn't have to say a word. There's a power in that. If there's anyone that should have been in a panic in that room, it was mom. And she was at peace. Because she liked the situation? No, it was hateful. But because she trusts God, that the one who has control over this situation, he cares. I know that. That gives you such a stability that it's powerful. I remember as I walked out, the nurse came up to me and she said, who are you people? And I told her, uh, we're from Faith Bridge or whatever. And I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, I have never seen anything like this. She said, this is not a happy place but there is such a peace and stability with you people that she's like, I don't, she didn't have words for it. And we said, it's not about the building here. It's about the God who reigns over us. The circumstances don't shake me. Why? Because the one who loves me rides over him. He is strong and he is loving and I am his. You have that, that's power. Whatever may come, the mountains can fall into the sea, but I won't cry if he stands with me, right? Hebrews 13 says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I think that's such the craziest combination of verses. He says, don't love money. And what do you expect him to say? Don't love money. Why? Because money can do really evil things and you can get evil if you get a lot of money and it's really bad and God will be mad at you. He doesn't say that. What does he say? Don't love money. Why? Because God said he'll never leave you or forsake you. You know, what? What's the writer of Hebrews getting to in us? Why do we want the ideal circumstance? Because we're looking at external things like money to make us feel safe, to make us feel safe. And he's trying to let us know circumstances won't give you that. Money won't give you serenity. It doesn't. But what does he say? The person who'll be content and happy 
is the person who knows. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Christian gets to say, the Lord is my helper, so I will not fear. What can man do to me? The more I see God as my helper, the more stable I am in any circumstance. The one who rides over my situation loves me. That's where contentment comes from, right? So here's the secret of contentment. The most content person in the world is simultaneously the most dissatisfied person in the world. That's the secret. The most content person in the world is also the most dissatisfied person in the world. And you say, what does that mean? What it means is they've come to know God as dad and so they can't settle for anything less. Right? That's what it means. Once you know God as your dad, you can't settle for less than that. And if you give me God as dad, take the house, take the car, take my health, I'm at peace. But if you give me the car, the house, the health, the money, the everything and know God, I'm not happy. That's the Christian secret. You give me the world and it's not enough. You take everything and give me him, I'm at peace no matter what you bring. Do you see that? I am strong because I am in the strengthening one, right? How do you get there? How do we get there? Two things. Number one is I pray to him. I open up conversation with God. I talk to him about my circumstances. I pray to him. So I can tell him, God, I'm in this financial bind. I want it to change. I'm coming to God every day of going, God, I want this physical ailment to change. I do. I don't want to lose strength in my right arm. I don't want that to happen. I don't want this, right? And I know I can do that. I know I can talk to him like that. Because now, especially as a dad, I know as a dad, my father's heart, I want my kids to talk to me like that. I want them to ask me for stuff. My little girls are almost two and three. They can't open the fridge, right? I don't want them to just starve in a corner. <laughs> if they're hungry, come tell me. If you want something to eat, come tell me. I don't want them to be demanding, give me some grape nuts or cereal. What? No. <laughs> give me some apple juice. You know, hey, hey, no, 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 no. I don't want them to be despairing. And clearly you don't care because there's no <laughs> applesauce in my hand right now. And so you don't love me and all is darkness, right? I mean, like, no. I don't want them to be demanding. I don't want them to be demoralized. I want them to ask me. I want them to ask me. And I want them to come to me knowing that I have a father's heart that loves them. So my little one will come up to me all the time and say, Daddy, hold you, which I think is so funny because I'm like, you're not holding me. I'm going to be holding you, but we'll work out the semantics later. <laughs> but she comes up to me and does that. I want you to hold me. Why does she do that? Because she knows I'm strong enough to. I am. I can pick up that little girl. <laughs> and she knows I want to. So she doesn't have a problem asking me, right? Now, there are moments when I can. I'm in the middle of this, that, whatever. But she doesn't freak out. She knows. She always knows. I'm strong enough, and I care. So she comes. And that's what we do. I come and say, God, I'm in need. God, hear the needs. And we come. We come honestly. We pray to him. We move towards him. Christian contentment is not hopeless resignation. I guess it's going to be this way. What will be, will be. No, that's not contentment. It's to try to act like you don't care. The Christian contentment is not a hopeless resignation. It's a hopeful dependence. I trust you. It's not throwing up my hands in desperation. It's throwing them up in dependence. I trust you with my life. I trust you. And then you preach to yourself. I pray to him. I preach to myself. I call my soul upward towards what is true. That's what the psalmist did, right? Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Hope in God. I love that, that the psalmist writes that. Him talking to himself makes me feel less crazy when I do. <laughs> and he says, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And then he doesn't just say, let's just sit in that and talk about how sad it all is. What does he say? Why are you downcast, O my soul? And then what does he say? Hope in God and forget not his benefits. And then he begins to describe them. 
So he talks to God about his problems, and then he talks to his problems about God. And he begins to tell him what his God is like, right? There's such power in that. So what do you do at 2 a.m. when you're in pain? I tell God about it. I do. And I wish it started all clean and wonderful. I wish I could say that when I sat on the couch, the first thing I did was like, I'm wide awake at two. What a unique opportunity to sing praise songs. When peace like a... (laughs) That's not really how it went. It started with, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like how it's going, etc., right? And so I poured it all out, and I did it because I know he cares. I know you want to hear this. I'm believing that. And then I turn around, and you start to think about truth. What, what's this world like, Ben? Let's talk it through. Should you be surprised that your body breaks? Does that blow your theology out of the water? No. The Bible's pretty clear. The whole world's broken emotionally, relationally, physically, sin devastated everything. And that devastation covers everyone. And it covers our our moral impulse. It covers our conscience, our relationships, and our bodies. Everything's broken. Should you be surprised that something broke in you? Everyone older than you dies. They've, They've all died. Like death is coming. Injury's coming. You get old. Human beings get old. Should that shock you? Should I sit here and be like, what? Why am I not as useful as my 20s? Because that's the world. It's broken. Don't be shocked by it. Be grieved by it, but not shocked by it. But where is God in that? Has he abandoned you, Ben? Does he not care? No. And all I need to do is look at the season we're in. Into the darkness, God has shown a great light. Do you know when that was written? When the nation of Israel was enslaved. As brutal as this is, what do they cry out? Yet we know our God is strong enough and loving enough to do something about it. And into the darkness, God has declared his power and love. How? The arrival of Jesus, right? Joy to the world. How does the world get joy? The Lord has come, that he stepped into it. And I just sat there and thought about Christmas that God doesn't leave me in my brokenness. The Christian story doesn't end in despair. God comes into it. Things are so bad here, he had to come, and he was so loving that he did. And Jesus broke the back of sin so that sin's power came from death, and he beat death, and death's power came from sin. He forgave sin. I have a future. I have a hope. I have life beyond the grave. This pain is not the end of my story because the first advent was to secure my salvation. The second advent is to lead me into it forever. That's how Horatio Spafford found strength when he wrote, it is well with my soul. How do you process the death of your daughters? He wrote a song about it. And he wrote a song about the bliss of the glorious thought that my sins, not in part, but the whole, were nailed to a cross and I bear them no more. He says that God stepped into our story and has done something decisiveness about the brokenness of this world. And then he prays, and Lord, haste the day when my faith will become sight and the skies be rolled back like a scroll and the Lord will descend, right? And we'll be with him. And that's when it'll be well with my soul. The first advent was to purchase me. The Prince of Peace came. And when I lean into him, I have peace. The second advent will be to take all this pain and brokenness away. And Lord, haste that day. And so I pray to him, here are my problems. And I preach to myself, look at your king who came for you, who's coming for you again. And the more I lean into him, the more stable I find him to be. And I am strong in the strength of the strengthening one. Let me pray for us. Lord, I don't know what drama we're dealing with at Christmas. There's a lot of fun, and I pray there would be a lot of fun. But there's a lot of pain and a lot of difficulty, a lot of opportunity to complain. And I pray, God, we wouldn't walk out of here with the real surface level, let me just keep my mouth shut when I want to complain. I pray we would let the deep heart thing set in. The world is broken and filled with hard things. Some relationships are hard. Some circumstances are hard. Some things are messy and won't be clean soon. And yet, God, we can be peaceful, inwardly, quiet. It can be an enduring peace. Why? 
because you are strong and you are loving. You came for us. You care for us. You forgive us. You are coming for us again. And the more we set our minds on you, the more stable we become. May we be a little pebble resting on a giant boulder that we are unmoved. Why? Because we're resting in you, the strong one. I pray that would be our story, God, this season and in our lives, that the world would see a supernatural calm, not because we're impressive, but because we've attached ourselves to the impressive one, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings and lover of our soul, Jesus Christ, who reunites us with his Father, lets us call God Dad. And I pray for any in this room that doesn't know you like that, God, they would come to the Son. You have come for us. May they come for you and trust. And for those of us who know you, Lord, may we lean into you, confessing our struggle and taking up your peace. May we be content because we have the best thing that life offers, you. Let that be our story, Jesus. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lewin Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Ben Stewart, who just um, finished up uh, Contentment from yes. Philippians, which was a nice follow-up from Anxiety. Yeah, yeah, Those right? fit together very yeah. well. And so when you think about um, contentment and Paul, you know, saying, talking about how in all our needs, mm -hmm. Christ has met him there. Um, you look at the world around and you see people who have these physical needs of food and basic health needs and starvation, people dying of starvation. And you look at them and you say, what do you say to that? How does this line up with this contentment that we find in these passages? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because... You know, contentment doesn't mean resignation of eh, what will be, what will be like. It means I'm not, I'm not going to be inwardly tumultuous about a situation that even in the midst of really difficult external environments, I can be peaceful. And you see in the history of the Christian church, they could do that. You would see Christians face their death, their martyrdom and be peaceful people. That doesn't mean they wanted to die. That mean they thought death was great. They didn't, but they could be at peace because I trust a God who rules my life and my death and my life after my death. They have that peace. But, you know, for Jesus, when he talked about contentment, that contentment was the place from which you give. You know, that's what he talked about in Luke, where he's saying, you know, don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Trust that your Father in heaven knows what you need. So seek his kingdom, sell your possessions and give to the poor. So that's what he's saying is the more content you are in your circumstances and trust that God's going to take care of you, the more liberated you are to look out for the needs of others. Mm -hmm. So a content Christian becomes a giving Christian, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and in your own needs, does contentment mean I don't seek answers? No, you know, like you can seek food, you know, but, but also that, that person who's hungry, can they trust God even in the midst of their hunger? Yes, we can trust him through the midst of incredible difficulty because he told us trouble's going to come, but I've overcome the world. I've got purposes beyond your present pain. Um, but for the Christian that's not in that condition, we should be racing towards that person to give relief. And that's what we do. Say, God's going to take care of me. He's going to make me an agent to care for you. And let's go. Awesome. And so I think about um, this idea of contentment versus like complacency. Mm -hmm. So I know my husband and I have this discussion a lot, just be happy with what we have and where we are. Yeah. Um, but balancing that with, should I just be happy in my job? Should I not work towards a promotion? Should I not be motivated or ambitious in my workplace because mm -hmm. I should just live in this place of contentment? Can you sort of speak to how that lines up with these verses? Yeah, totally. Well, and that's a, a really big worldview question of, you know, like um, motive matters to God. The why matters to people, you know? And so you can do the same act and do it from a really good motive, a really bad one. And so that's the question is like, why am I pursuing a particular thing? 
And, you know, when God first created us, he made the world. Um, he told Adam to be industrious, you know, that God brought form so that the world could be filled with life. And he tells Adam, cultivate and keep the garden, protect it and cultivate it. Meaning it's going to be fruitful. Keep pressing to make conditions, Adam, where it'll be more fruitful. So God designs industry. Mm -hmm. Be the best at what you can do. Work hard as if working for the Lord and not for men. So there's a place for industry, but it's to glorify God for the good of humanity around me. And so that's why for me, it's like, I want to give the best sermon I can. Why? So I'll be a better speaker than, oh, that's a terrible motive. So I can make more than, no, that's a horrible motive. So I can honor God with the beauty of a well-crafted sermon. And so I can maybe help you. Mm -hmm. That's a good reason. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that can come from a content place, you know, yeah. instead of an ang anxiety, I've got to reach this thing in order to feel good about myself. So that's where it takes some real deep introspection to go, what's my motive? Where's what's dri what's my, driving the energy? Heart, yeah. Where it's coming from. Yeah. So there's a place for agency. And, and Paul was a very industrious person, but it came from a place of contentment. He was okay. So when he landed in prison, he wasn't like, I got to get out of here. I got to get to Macedonia. You're like, no, he's, he's like, okay, God, use me in prison. You know, there's a peaceful place. What a great word. And yeah. um, so that wraps up your time here at Faithbridge for the year. Yeah, and right. um, we certainly um, wish the Stewart family the best this holiday season. Oh, Hope thanks. you guys have a nice break and well, Merry Christmas. Yeah, and we look forward you. to seeing you back next year. Yeah, sounds All good. right. And yeah. thank you for joining us here at Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.